This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. And with that, we begin another 30 minutes of all the ag news and information you can handle. Hi again, folks. Welcome to the latest installment of the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Yes, we're glad you're here, and you'll be too when you see what we have in store for you today. Coming up, wondering what the effects of the trade issues will have on peanuts this year. One expert weighs in and explains why we shouldn't expect those high contract prices. Also, hear what's on the horizon as producers gathered in Savannah for this year's Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference. John Holcomb will have a full recap. Plus, there is much Americana as the Super Bowl itself. Talking about that majestic animal known as the Clydesdale. We're going to take you to a farm here in Georgia that raises them and why its owner says there is no other breed like them. These stories and so much more are starting right now on the Farm Monitor. With the ongoing trade wars, abundant surplus, and a new farm bill, there are a number of questions for peanut growers heading into the new year. Damon Jones recently spoke with industry experts at the annual Peanut Farm Show and Conference in Tifton and has the story. With Georgia being responsible for nearly half of the peanut production in the U.S., events like this farm show and conference are vitally important as it gives farmers a chance to get the latest updates and check out the newest technology. And despite heavy rains caused by Hurricane Michael during the growing season, the 2018 crop was another bumper one. Now we're sitting at 4,380 pounds or so, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, the biggest thing that helped us there was the rains and all on dry land. The dry land is what made this crop this year bigger and better than what it should have been. However, that could have a negative impact on the price as another record yield will only add to the surplus. So the market's looking a little difficult for peanuts just because there is a, a large supply. It started two years ago with the record crop in 2017 and uh, for 2018 a lot of acres were still planted. Even though down 21% in acres, it's still a lot of acres uh, just because of that oversupply from 2017. In all reality, this is going to be another depressed year where we're not going to see those high, high contract prices. Uh, I, I'm kind of estimating it might be the same as what we saw last year. Um, I think we're, we're going to get contracts, they're going to not be so bad, but again, this is a market and we, we never know what's going to happen. A lot of that uncertainty stems from the international demand as tariffs against China have depressed the market. Exports are down a little bit this year uh, as a result of some of the trade issues and uh, demand is starting to get a little stagnant overall, even though there's some good still increases in terms of uh, domestic use for food, uh, we're kind of looking a little flat in terms of overall demand. That means a cut in supply might be necessary for the prices to stabilize. However, that could be dependent on another commodity. I say if cotton would rebound here and get back in the 80 cent range, 90 cent range, we would see a lot of acres, you know, that was thinking, well, we're going to plant peanuts, we go to cotton. And that's what we need ha to happen. But we're not going to move a lot. We're not, I don't think we're going to move down tr tremendously um, because when you put a pencil to it, peanuts are still one of the ones that we can make money on. As for the new farm bill that was recently passed, it remains to be seen how it affects the peanut industry as the government shutdown has lasted more than a month. With the new farm bill that passed shortly after the government shut down and so rules have not been able to be written, that's going to delay any uh, opportunities when farmers are going to have to make decisions. We don't have deadlines yet and that's a good thing because any deadlines would have to be continually pushed out as the government shut down. So with that many questions heading into the new year, what is one piece of advice for the farmers? Financially, I'd say really be careful in terms of what your cost of productions are. Pay close attention in terms of your input costs. We're seeing some input costs increasing for 2019. Diesel is the one area where we're seeing down in, in terms of costs, so that's certainly good news. Reporting from Tifton, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, thank you so much. Another Ag News, American Farm Bureau reports that USDA reopening its farm service agency during the government shutdown was a huge win for farmers and ranchers. Chief Economist John Newton says FSA offices are providing the normal services, including necessary operating loans, crop insurance, crop disaster assistance, and more. 
USDA's Farm Service Agency makes about $25 billion a year in direct operating loans and real estate loans to farmers and ranchers, to young and beginning farmers. So opening those offices up and allowing the FSA officials to make those agricultural loans, very important. We also have the market facilitation trade assistance packages that FSA officials can begin to process. Those are just two of a number of really important things that FSA is now able to deliver to farmers and ranchers. Meantime, fruit and vegetable producers from across the southeast met in Savannah recently to discuss issues facing the industry. The annual Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference offers a trade show, the opportunity to network, and educational sessions prior to the start of the 2019 growing season. John Holcomb reports. Each and every year, the Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference brings growers from a number of different states together under one roof to see some of the advancements made in an ever-changing industry. Producers that attend get to do everything from networking to seeing the latest and greatest equipment. This conference is designed for our growers. It's to help our growers uh, learn uh, more uh, and improved uh, production techniques. The trade show offers vendors uh, opportunities for equipment, services, uh, all sorts of different things that, will, that would be a benefit to the growers. The conference also offers several educational sessions for producers on various topics. One of the sessions had to do with Georgia's most signature crop, peaches. The topic had to do with managing pests that affect peach trees, and the main focus is on the most severe, the San Jose scale. This is a tiny little insect that can feed on the tree itself. So it doesn't cause major damage to the fruit, but it can slowly suck out the sap of the tree, which then slowly kills it. It starts out with killing small branches and then entire limbs. Luckily, the University of Georgia has been doing research and has some ways to treat peach trees for this troublesome pest. Right now, um, our really best management practice is to do two dormant oil sprays. So we do one application of like a horticultural oil uh, late fall, and then we come back in the early spring, right basically as the buds begin to swell on the trees, we add a, a, a second application of the horticultural oil. Of course, fruit isn't the only thing affected by a pest. Vegetable growers also have to deal with Mother Nature's twist, like whiteflies and viruses. We've had uh, a couple of years where we had very high whitefly populations, very high virus incidents, and again, we had some crops that were basically wiped out in fall production in South Georgia uh, in 2017. Uh, they weren't as severely impacted in 2018, but they were still very severely impacted. Barks talked to producers about treating whiteflies, and he says the number one thing a producer can do is to destroy and rotate. White flies, uh, we want to you know, emphasize crop destruction when you're done with the crop so that you're not sending huge populations into that next crop. Uh, within a crop, it's, it's largely insecticides. Right now for white flies, uh, we emphasize uh, insecticide rotation because we have had some, uh, some resistance problems uh, and uh, those can be severe. And as for the best thing to prevent the spread of viruses in vegetable crops, resistance from the ground up. Best thing we've got for viruses where we have it is, res is uh, resistant plant types post plant resistance, uh, that by far surpasses anything else we can do for virus suppression. Other than that, it's really you've got to combine as many different things as you can. You're looking at uh, cultural practices, planting dates, uh, what varieties you select, uh, reflective mulches, insecticides, uh, barriers. Reporting in Savannah for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, John, great job. Well, they are one of the most recognizable horse breeds worldwide thanks to their massive height, feathered-like feet, and of course, a well-known beer distributor. After the break, Ray takes us to a one-of-a-kind operation right here in Georgia that specializes in Clydesdales. Well, I'm Joe Burnham. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Conservation Section. And we are at Silver Lake WMA, um, and we're standing in a red cockaded woodpecker cluster that was impacted pretty severely by Hurricane Michael. Um, you can see that we lost a lot of trees here, um, many of which were uh, cavity trees used by 
the, the RCW. Here's one right here that blew over. This is a natural cavity, and this tree blew over at the base, but a lot of trees snapped off and a lot of trees snapped off at the cavity height. They are endangered, and, and they're the only woodpecker to excavate their cavity in a living tree, which takes a long time. So in a situation like this where you lose the majority of their cavity trees, we lost almost half here at Silver Lake. They're very vulnerable because they no longer have somewhere to stay and it takes them so long to make new homes. So it was, it's pretty important to get in here and put in inserts as quickly as we can so that we can try to mitigate some of the impacts of the storm. There are some other challenges that we're looking at going forward. Red cockaded woodpeckers, bobwhite quail, Bachman sparrows, a lot of the species we manage for in these longleaf pine forests require frequent fire. And so we burn these stands um, about every two years and we've got some new challenges we're gonna be facing going forward because we're no longer able to get in here and do internal ignition because there's so much heavy debris and heavy fuel on the ground that impedes access. And we've also got a lot of fuel along the edges of the roads. What this is gonna do is it, it creates essentially brush piles of heavy fuel which when we do burn, are gonna to tend to get pretty hot, which can then impact the residual trees and cause additional mortality. Although this looks bad, um, because there are so many trees down, it, it's not the end of the world long-term. Um, we heard uh, red cockaded woodpeckers here just a minute ago. He's on the side of the tree. And some of the replacement cavity inserts that we put in after the storm are already being used. The fact that we're still seeing and hearing birds and we're seeing activity on the new cavities uh, gives us hope. And I think going forward we'll be okay thanks to the prompt response that of DNR folks and, and other partners, conservation partners who chipped in and, and helped out on short notice. Always good to see progress. Well, Budweiser made them famous this weekend, Super Bowl weekend, and its commercials gave them a platform. But did you know that the Clydesdale was evolved by Scottish farmers? Did you also know that Classic City Clydesdale in Bishop, Georgia is world renowned for its breeding program and that its operation is the only one of its kind in the Southeast? If you've never seen one of these animals up close and personal, trust me when I say folks, they are breathtaking. Known for their massive size, stepping action, and gentle temperament, the first breed of Clydesdales can be traced back to the 1800s in the farmlands of Scotland. For Shannon Martin, a native of Michigan, her affection for the breed began a little over 20 years ago. To this day, Shannon insists there is no horse like a Clydesdale. These guys are the most kind, most forgiving animal on the planet. Um, you can do things with the Clydesdale that you would definitely hesitate to do with other breeds. Um, I always say they're the most kid-friendly, husband-safe horse there is. We got our first Clydesdale in 1998, um, and it was because uh, my husband, who I had met, wanted to find a horse he could ride with me on the weekends. Um, I had worked in high school with a lady who would go to horse auctions, buy unbroke prospects, break them, and resell them as riding horses. I always like to say I was her crash test dummy. Um, so on the weekends when I got out of the Air Force, I was riding a little 14-hand Cremello pony. I have no idea what breed it was, and Mark decided he wanted to ride with me. So we went to a horse auction because it's what I knew. Um, this was up in Jackson, Michigan, um, and in through the arena came a two-year-old Clydesdale stud colt. And he looked at it and said, that's what I got to have. And at that time, I thought, what in the heck are we going to do with this thing? Um, fast forward almost 20 years, and here we are with a head of uh, about 35 head of Clydesdale horses, and I can't imagine having any other breed. Typically, when one thinks of a Clydesdale, they think of a workhorse of sorts, pardon the expression, a carriage ride, obviously pulling the Budweiser wagon. But according to Shannon, they are much more than that. In fact, these animals are very versatile. Are they workhorses? Sure, sure, that's what their, their history was, but we're making new history with them now. Um, in fact, at our world show up in Madison, Wisconsin in October was the first time we've introduced a dressage section to our world show. So we're doing a lot more riding with these guys. They're super versatile. Um, now, are they gonna be big jumpers? No, probably not. But you know that, take them out on a trail on the weekend, they love it. They have a great time with it. 
Shannon admits raising Clydesdales is not for everyone, especially with the always changing climate here in Georgia. For one, they prefer colder temperatures, one of the reasons why Classic City is a rare find here in the southeast. Additionally, their massive size requires some extra attention. It is kind of a joke here on the farm that I do usually give about 100 reasons why somebody should not own a Clydesdale compared to the one reason why they should. Um, and it's not because I don't want people to enjoy these horses. It's just I really love them and I want to make sure that they land in the best possible environment. Um, the feather that's on their legs definitely requires uh, daily maintenance. You definitely have to watch that. It can be a source of illness and injury for them. Um, and they are big horses, so they require an ample amount of feed to keep them comfortable. Um, these aren't a, a breed of horse that you just throw out to the pasture and bring in once a week for a trail ride. They definitely need that, that constant, hi, that constant interaction um, to stay happy and healthy. In the last couple of years since our barn fire in 2016, we realized that a lot of what we do is here. This is what we enjoy. We enjoy the babies, we enjoy the moms, um, and enjoy sharing them with the public. So we did open up the farm to tours last year. Um, you can come here uh, uh, any, usually Wednesday, Friday, Saturday at 11 and enjoy a tour of the farm, meet the horses up close and personal. Um, we also do by appointment trail rides. So if you're interested in riding one of these gentle giants, you definitely can. Um, but that's basically what we do here. We, we want to be the, the beacon for Clydesdale horses in the South, basically, because the South was settled by mules. So you don't see these big draft horses very often. They are a thing of beauty, aren't they? And folks, do not forget, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, The Farm Monitor. All kinds of good info on there, crop reports, features, recipes, you name it. Plenty of stuff to choose from. In fact, the archive goes all the way back to 2009. And while you're online, keep clicking and like the Farm Monitor Facebook page. Get involved as well. If you have a story idea, send us a message either on Facebook or the address on your screen. That's news at farm-monitor.com. Up next, American Farm Bureau honors a man many consider a one-of-a-kind advocate for agriculture. He served 42 years in the U.S. Senate and was awarded the Medal of Freedom by President Trump. The legend of Orrin Hatch when the Farm Monitor continues. Reagan described Orrin Hatch as a man of quality, courage, discipline, and integrity. A man who believes in individual freedom and self-reliance. That was in 1976. 42 years later, President Trump awarded him the Medal of Freedom and described him as a true American statesman. He's the longest serving Republican senator in history perhaps the most effective of either political party, and a strong advocate in Congress for farmers and ranchers. We don't want the farmers dumped on, and we want to make sure that their rights are preserved. The best thing we can do is make sure they are. So we've done that over the years, and I think we've been pretty, pretty good for our farmers. Senator Hatch loves farmers and ranchers, and every single time that I came to D.C. as the Farm Bureau president, he would make time to see me and I know he was extremely busy. As a young senator, he raised the Sagebrush Rebellion, a revolt against heavy-handed public lands policies in the West. Well, I think the Sagebrush Rebellion rocked the uh, far left back on their heels. And they had, to, they had to start being a little more reasonable and had to start recognizing that some of our Western states are heavily owned by government. More recently, Senator Hatch convinced President Trump to scale back two national monuments to more reasonable sizes. So that we can now utilize those, those public lands for hunting and fishing and agriculture and, and also mining. President pro tempore of the Senate and chairman of the Finance Committee, Hatch fought to create jobs and strengthen the economy. He championed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in the Senate. Just cutting taxes is a, a tremendous value to uh, to people on farms and people who 
you know, are worried about whether they can continue to maintain their farming. However, a draft of the tax bill contained an unrelated business income tax, or UBIT, on royalties received by tax-exempt organizations. The tax would have been a serious blow to state farm bureaus and AFBF. Finally, we got to Senator Hatch, and he said, you have to stop this for us. Senator Hatch took the bill and hand wrote a little note on that bill, wrote an amendment that, in my view, saved Farm Bureau. And that's probably a fitting way for him to end his career with Farm Bureau, is showing us that he cared about agriculture. No Senator Alive sponsored more bills that have become law than Senator Hatch. Now he's retired from the Senate, but not necessarily from public life. It's tough to decide what to do, but I know one thing, I want to be effective, I want to be productive, I want to help my state, I want to help my family. And uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, would love to help this country. The respect and admiration that all of Farm Bureau feels for Senator Hatch goes both ways. Farm Bureau is, is, is the premier farm advocate in this country today. And they're honest. Uh, they're faithful, they are very, very uh, sharp with regard to the issues, and uh, they make a real difference for rural America. Senator Orrin Hatch, winner of the 2019 American Farm Bureau Distinguished Service to Agriculture Award. Finally this week, we check in just north of the Georgia border and our main man, Charles Denny a 4-H program that encourages teens to think beyond the high school years. In his report, Charles tells us what kids learn and the decisions that they'll face. 4-H is about creating a better life for young people, teaching citizenship, community involvement, how to be a leader. And to get to that promising future, teens need to make good decisions now. These high school 4-Hers are in a new program called Next Chapter, as in what's the exciting next chapter in their young lives. Yes, I really am planning on going to college and I've been looking into interior design and architecture. I know definitely something with the arts, like musical arts, possibly like painting or drawing. And if you're undecided, that's cool too. Next chapter is about options. A cooperative effort between Tennessee 4-H, UT's Herbert College of Agriculture, and UTK's Office of Admissions, with a focus on going to college and career development. Here the lesson plan is called a different kind of selfie, an opportunity for kids like Winner Wright to really learn about themselves. I kind of want to figure out my career and what I want to do, what direction I want to go in. You know, medicine or working with animals. You know, cosmetology, chemistry, something like that. 4 Hers even had a lesson plan involving a can of soup. They were asked how many careers were involved to make this. There were farmers, of course, but also business managers, food scientists, transportation people, and even marketing experts trying to persuade people to buy this product. So we're trying to get them aware of all the careers that are out there. And then um, this week we're going to be looking at what makes up me, what are my strengths and my abilities, and then how could I apply that back to a career? How do you fit those two together? And I had a mind map of a career. Trudy Newbeck is a volunteer helping to teach the program. Leaders here also talk about goal setting and even life skills with an eye on future independence. Yes, we definitely want to focus on life skills. So, like I said, with transportation or cooking or washing clothes, different things like that, that will prepare them to be ready when either they're in a dorm setting in college or an apartment. For kids at this age, time often moves in a blur. Their future will be here really soon. And with the right skills, they'll be ready. This is Charles Denny reporting. Charles, thank you so much, and folks, thank you for watching. Take care, everybody. We'll see you right here next week on the Farm Monitor. Be safe.